Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. Our topic today is muscle and motor proteins, and this is the first, as usual, of the multiple step process designed to give you mastery of this topic. Let me emphasize that we're going to be focused very narrowly on muscle specifically. However, what you'll see is that, or what I want you to be aware of, is that muscle is paradigmatic of a larger group of processes. You'll see that there's a particular motor that's involved in physically moving uh, muscle fibers in order to contract the muscle in the way that we'll see in the next couple of minutes, and that there are other motors, very much like the motor here. It's a my myosin molecule is the motor. And uh, though we won't talk about those other molecules, the underlying biochemistry, the sort of uh, molecular trickery that's involved in muscle contraction is used in other contexts to move things around the cell in a program in a specific way. So we're learning, in other words, specific lessons about muscles, but also very general lessons uh, about um, motors in general. Uh, also, this is a, an example, very much like the hemoglobin case we already saw, of seeing how uh, um, uh, molecules aren't just catalysts that catalyze chemical reactions, but they can literally be machines in the very sense, very analogous to the sense that humans would build a machine. And the muscle proteins, myosin in particular here, is, uh, the, is, is really overtly a machine, almost like a, a human would build with ratchets and pulleys and, and so on. So uh, it, this gives us a real opportunity to understand also the transition from the molecular level that's really impossibly small from an intuitive point of view, all the way up to the macroscopic level, our ability to move our arms and, and, and uh, to speak and walk and so on. So it's an excellent opportunity not only to learn some basic biochemistry, some really elegant and beautiful biochemistry, but to also get a better sense of how biochemistry is producing the macroscopic phenomenon of organisms that we, that we are so intuitively aware of. So let's start actually literally with, uh, this is, a, I guess, a right arm. You know, the skin has been peeled off so you can see the muscles and the bones. Notice that there's an elbow joint that, that will rotate and then there's a muscle connected at the top and then just beyond the elbow joint and when it contracts it rotates around that joint and has the the effect of popping the arm up like this. This is a bicep muscle I'm sure you're aware. Notice that the muscle gets shorter and fatter when that happens. That's a result of m very specific set of molecular events that should do exactly what you're seeing on the screen. The muscle should get shorter and fatter and so watch for that connection between the molecular and the macroscopic. So let's now walk down from the mic macroscopic to the molecular, and then we'll pop back up to the macroscopic again, and then we'll dive into the molecular details, which is really our substance uh, and focus here today. So again, notice the, the full muscle, the complete muscle, that's at the top left of this diagram. Then it's made up of smaller subunits called fascicles, so we have hierarchically nested combinatorial organization here. Then each fascicle is made up of, of a set of muscle fibers, which are large polynucleated cells, sometimes called syncytial cells, where multi cells earlier in the development of the muscle have fused to produce a really large cell. And then inside each of those muscle cells are a set of uh, uh, smaller structures, ultimately culminating in the myofibril that you see at the lower right. And each of the sarcomeres, you'll notice at the lower right, making up the myofibril is where our focus will be today. And notice then that sticking out of the end of the myofibril is an actin and a myosin uh, polymer, making up the, the functional components of the individual sarcomeres. And over the next couple of minutes, we'll see how all of these different molecular pieces relate to one another. But let's make one other point first. So we have another myofibril here and a sarcomere. And now we're, if you look at the bottom, you'll see two sets of filaments, one in a, sort of a dark pink and one in a bright red. One of those is myosin, one of those is, uh, is a myosin polymer, many copies of myosin. The other is an actin polymer, many copies of uh, actin, making long rope-like structures which are going to burn energy and pull with respect to one another. Notice the arrows I'm flashing in and out here. That is, uh, one will pull in one direction, the other in the opposite direction with strong energy expense, shortening and contracting the muscle. Again, details are forthcoming in a moment. But as you might imagine, as these things starting far apart and sliding together, the muscle gets shorter, and of course it gets fatter because these, these formally separate things are now piling up on top of one another. So the molecular details, these are individual actin molecules and individual myosin molecules, as we'll see in the next few minutes, and they're sliding, millions of copies of them sliding together, uh, contracts the muscle, making it shorter and fatter. And of course, again, the result of millions of those molecules acting in concert is that the muscle does what you and I are so familiar with macroscopically. All right, so let's 
put the pieces together, get a feeling for what this machinery looks like. So this is again the same image you saw a moment ago. And now let me call your attention by flashing it on and off the screen a couple of times that the red things are myosin. Actually, there are many copies of the myosin molecule details to forthcoming in a moment. And the sort of purpley pink things are actin. Again, polymers, many copies of actin. And as you'll see, the actin is going to act kind of as a passive rope, and the myosin is going to act as an active thing pulling on that rope, causing these two things to move, translocate with respect to one another. And how that's done and how that's made to make thermodynamic sense and mechanical sense will be our goal over the next couple of minutes. And again, watch for the kind of beautiful elegance and ultimately the simplicity of this process. Natural selection is really good at finding simple and powerful tricks for doing really important things like allowing an animal to move around the landscape, for example. Okay. Notice also the little, uh, many copies of the little bead-like structure sticking off of the myosin polymer. Those are the myosin head groups and they are the business end of the motor. Uh, so myosin forms a rope and then these little motors stick out of it and they're going to function in ways that we'll see a lot more about over the next couple of minutes. Okay, so what I want to do now is zero in. These are all cartoons. Let's zero in and look at what muscle actually looks like in the electron microscope. So this is a thin section through muscle. This voluntary muscle, the ones we move when we think we want to move stuff, are often called striated muscle because of these very characteristic um, uh, structures, stria. So let's uh, go through the nomenclature that you need to know to talk about muscles and exam questions will come from this nomenclature as well. So let's, here is our sarcomere again. And again, notice that we're looking at the electron micrograph of a real living piece of tissue. So this is the sarcomere in cartoon. This is the sarcomere in the electron microscope. The sarcomere boundaries are uh, what are called Z lines. We'll talk a little bit later about several of the molecules that are in those. We're not going to pay a lot of attention to that here. But they form a kind of a disc-like uh, structure that spans the entire sarcomere unit, uh, the myofibril myofibrillar fibrillar unit. And uh, the actin filaments bind uh, 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 to those uh, elements. So you have uh, actin filaments sticking out here, but they're bound to something here. So when the actin filaments are pulled in uh, by, by myosin as it skates over them, as you'll see in a moment, it's going to pull those Z lines together. And of course, these, these Z lines are all lined up uh, back to back to back in a sarcomere. There's another set of actin filaments not shown here, projecting uh, outward from these, Z, these uh, Z discs or Z lines, so that when you pull, when this one pulls on one, the one next door is pulling on it as well, and the entire myofibril will shrink and get, get shorter and fatter as a result, okay? Just to get oriented here. So again, we're coming back to the electron micrograph of the same structure. Uh, something called the H zone here. Notice that it's the area uh, between the uh, actin filaments. And as those actinments, actin filaments come together, the H zone gets smaller. And as the muscle relaxes, the H zone gets bigger again. The A band, this is just kind of electron microscopist nomenclature, is the H zone plus the surrounding areas that are darker. Those are the areas where the actin and the myosin filaments are both present. So it, there's a lot more electron density here uh, because you have both myosin and actin, not just myosin only or actin only, as you have in the H zone and outside uh, of the uh, uh, A band. Um, as we'll see in, in a moment when we look at them in cross section, okay? And then this is called the I band again nomenclature. This is a, this overlaps two different sarcomeres. Remember that the Z discs or the Z lines are the end of the functional sarcomere, but of course they're connected sarcomere head to tail um, uh, all the way through the muscle. So the the I band is actually a piece of one unit and a piece of its neighboring unit, uh, consisting again of only actin filaments now in this case, with uh, no myosin filaments in the neighborhood in this uh, particular position. This M disc here is another structure whose elements are not diagrammed in the, in the uh, um, cartoon at the bottom of the image that you're seeing. That's another set of molecules like the Z discs that are involved in positioning uh, the different pieces with respect to one another. We'll come back to that, uh, a couple of the relevant details of that a little bit later. Our real focus here is though is not so much these uh, surrounding context. That's just the context is to give you an idea of why when actin and myosin move with respect to one another, the muscle as a whole contracts and shortens and gets fatter. We're really concerned though with that, that powered movement. <laughs>